adding to that great variety with our next speaker. Um, she started her career as an attorney, bought some land, and realized that farming was going to be very, very cool. She now owns Love Apple Farms. It's a 22-acre biodynamic farm in California and grows vegetables exclusively for the two Michelin star restaurant Manresa in the Bay Area. Last week, she spoke at the Man Symposium in Copenhagen, and uh, this week, uh, she's here with us. Please welcome Cynthia Sandberg. Scandinavia is that a lot of folks already have heard about biodynamics. Unfortunately, in the U.S., it's still something that we have a really hard time even hearing about, let alone seeing some products out there in the store. And I think that um, worldwide, it's it's an up-and-coming movement, even though it's been around for for a hundred or so years. And we're going to just go through some of the practicalities of biodynamics, what makes it different from organic, and what really, what are the basic principles. This is the um, definition of biodynamic agriculture. It is a holistic system that is regenerative, and it seeks to focus on not only the soil health, but the integration of plants and animals in one big biodiversity ball of good stuff. It was originally founded by, or thought up by Rudolf Steiner, as many of you already know. 
back in the 1920s. He was a visionary and he was quite the Renaissance man. He had a lot of um, great um, things that he thought about and helped the community with and the greater uh, world even today. His um, tentacles go far and wide as to his philosophies, not only his anthroposophy philosophy, which is quasi-religion, but also, um, more importantly to me, the system of Waldorf education of young children, and also, of course, biodynamic agriculture. So the basic principles of biodynamics is that it is a, the farm is a closed-loop system. We're going to go through each of these in a bit. Animals are key. Um, seeds are saved. That's a must. Um, biodiversity is maintained. Um, and uh, farm animals are... Um, very key to the system, homeopathic preparations are applied to the compost in the soil, and the astrological planting calendar is observed, and we'll talk about that too. Um, Biodynamics uh, has a certifying body uh, called Demeter, or Demeter, tomato, tomato. She's the Greek goddess of fertility. She's always um, shown holding a sheaf of wheat. wheat. Uh, Demeter is uh, the only worldwide certifying body um, of organic type biodynamic farms in the world. And I think that's really important when Felipe earlier was talking about he's got how many, eight or 10 different certified bodies just in Brazil alone for organics. In California, it's similar. There are just as many 10 uh, 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 certified bodies for organic farms in California. And if you can see worldwide how some of those standards could be um, mutated unless there was a commonality among them. And with Demeter, if you're a Demeter certified farm in Denmark, you have to rise to the same principles as a Demeter certified farm in California like mine is. So I think that's pretty cool. So the farm unit is a closed loop and it seeks to pay attention to all of these different principles about farming and biodynamics and it brings in the earth, uh, the uh, cosmic forces, and it seeks to harness the, uh, the uh, terrestrial forces as well. Um, talking about what a closed loop system means to my farm and to the far, uh, other farmers that grow biodynamically, is that it stresses a low carbon footprint. The farm must produce its own fertility. Um, composting is, um, is an absolute requirement. Green manures are used. Animals are fed from the farm. Seed is saved. Uh, my farm, Love Apple, it also includes Manresa restaurant in our closed loop. And so our, of course, our vegetables go to Manresa. All of the kitchen scraps come back to the farm and we compost those. Those go back on the planting beds and so it goes. So creating your own compost is required. It's not even an option. This is one of the differences, many differences between biodynamic and organic. An organic farmer can't, doesn't have to compost at all. He just has to buy compost, get compost onto his land. It's not a requirement that he create it. With biodynamics, it's an absolute requirement. We also do, in order to increase our fertility, we also um, uh, keep worms. And their uh, worm dung, call, euphemistically called worm castings, is also a really important part of our fertility program too. We get the worm castings on the planting beds, we make a tea or an elixir, fertility elixir, out of the worm castings, and we pour and spray that on the um, plants as well. So animals are an absolute requirement on a biodynamic farm. Again, another difference between organics and biodynamic. You can be an organic grower, not have one animal on the farm. Um, but with, our, with biodynamics, you have to. So with us at Love Apple, we have chickens, we have beehives, and we also have um, five dairy goats that flummox our apprentices every morning and evening by um, not giving up their milk as easily as they would, the apprentices would like. And it's great for some of these city kids who are their first time on the farm to see them try to go milk a goat. Um, Another thing is that the farmer, in, in most closed loop systems, the reason that the, the animal is there to give you this fabulous fertility that you then compost and put on the planting beds. The other thing that the um, farmer is expected to do is either eat the animals or eat their products, so in the, our case, chicken eggs and uh, milk from the dairy goats. And then finally, biodynamics absolutely requires that all the animals be humanely treated. No confined spaces, like a lot of the veal calves are um, subject to these days. No de-beaking of the chickens. They have to be treated, treated in a humane fashion in order to um, be on a biodynamic certified farm. Let's talk about the special preparations. 
Uh, they are applied both to the soil and to the compost piles. Um, Steiner believed that each of the preps that we're going to go into shortly either maintained fertility, enhanced fertility, reduced pest stress, or reduced uh, disease stress. Uh, and it was very important for um, biodynamic farmers to use these homeopathic um, type elixirs. That's another big difference between um, organic and biodynamic. The farm doesn't have to create them, but we get together in a group, biodynamic farm group, and we create them together. Um, especially the more difficult preps that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, this is the one that gets a lot of press in the biodynamic literature, in the mainstream literature, the horn manure, uh, which is uh, collected from cows that are being grass-fed, because uh, feeding cows corn is against their nature. Um, we, they're stuffed into a cow horn and it's buried in the ground uh, between the um, fall and the spring equinox so that it's accepting and infusing the manure with the life forces of the, um, of the of Mother Earth. Uh, when we're ready to apply it to the land in the fall, we do it at dusk, we stir it for an hour, um, creating a vortex, and while we're doing that, we're very uh, still and silent and contemplative, and what we're trying to do is we're infusing our own energy and the astral energy into the water as we're um, making it biodynamic, and then we will flick it onto the soil above um, the beds uh, at dusk, because in the wintertime, the, the land is breathing in, and at dusk, the uh, sun is going down. It's also achieving a little bit better bre uh, breathing in of the horn, um, horn manure. The second major preparation is called the 501 horn silica. That's made from finely ground quartz that's also stuffed into a, a cow horn, also buried in the, in the um, dirt for um, six months at the different time of the year. It's accepting the astral forces and the terrestrial forces as well. In the springtime at dawn, we apply that above the plants in a fine mist. Um, and that will, as, as we do that in a fine mist, the sun's rays coming in at dawn um, are, gets diffused by the light, refracted by the light, and it helps the uh, young crops um, uh, ward off fun fungal diseases, and it helps them um, not to bolt, which is to come to maturity too quickly. So let's talk about the compost preparations. This is the first one, 502. It's the yarrow prep. It's made from yarrow flour stuffed into a stag's bladder. And that bottom picture is a ni nicely sewn up stag's bladder uh, after it's been stuffed with the dried yarrow flowers. It is buried, um, it's not buried, it's one of the few that's not buried. It's hung in a tree uh, to absorb the sun's energy for six months, and then it's buried um, in the ground for another six months, so it's a whole year in the making for the yarrow prep. We apply this to the compost pile. Every compost pile that we do gets all of the preparations, the compost preps applied to it. This is another prep called the 503. It's the chamomile prep. It is made from chamomile, dried chamomile flour stuffed into the intestines of a cow. It is buried for six months, also applied to the compost pile. Steiner theorized that it stabilized uh, calcium, assimilates calcium and stabilized nitrogen. This is a stinging nettle prep. It doesn't get stuffed into an um, animal sheath. Uh, it, it stimulates soil health and releases iron and it helps plants acclimate to their microclimates. Um, nettle is harvested in the spring or early summer. That's an important part of the equation. And then it is dried and um, buried in the ground for 12 months in an earthenware container to continue absorption of the terrestrial forces. The oak bark prep 505 is um, we shave the exterior of an eastern oak tree's bark. We don't hit the cambium layer, so we're not going to hurt the tree. And that, we finally grind that and we stuff it into a freshly harvested skull of a domesticated horned animal. And that is then uh, buried in a swampy, wet area for six months until it's um, taken up, harvested the um, oak bark from the interior of the skull, and then that is applied to the compost pile as well. The 506 dandelion prep is just normal dandelion flowers that have been stuffed into a cow's mesentery. A mesentery is the sheath that surrounds the stomach of a cow. Um, Steiner theorized that this helps aid in the compost pile um, 
adapting, the plants adapting to the microclimate and silica processes that are important in all plant life. The last compost prep is 507. It's the liquid prep valerian. It's, it's a tincture made from um, dried and pressed valerian flowers. It is sprinkled on the compost pile after we dynamize it with a, um, with a vortex stirring as well. It is said to fix hummus in the compost pile. Uh, another um, tenet of biodynamic growing is that seed saving is a must. Uh, because Steiner theorized that if you save seeds um, and you, over time, year after year, those seeds adapt to the microclimate that is your personal terroir. And so um, if I save the seed every year of the best green giant tomato plant, over time, after four or five, six years, I'm going to have a seed that is perfectly suited to my little bit of California coastline 70 miles uh, south of San Francisco. Hybrids are discouraged because they're not open pollinated. The difference between hybrid and open pollinated is you can save the seed of an open pollinated um, vegetable variety and as long as it hasn't cross pollinated during that um, first year out in the field. You should get the same type of variety of vegetable if you grow it out the following year. It's so true, um, in other words. Uh, a hybrid is two or more genetic parents that is not necessarily very low likelihood that it will sow true after you um, plant it the next year. And so a s farm that's going to seek to be a closed loop, meaning that it's only going to take products off of its own land, um, has to absolutely save seed. And then finally, um, we cannot use in any way, shape, or form any genetically modified um, seeds. And Demeter is one of the largest organizations that is fighting Monsanto and GMOs on a worldwide level, and we should be thankful for that. Biodiversity is required. That means that as far as Demeter is required, at least 10% of either, of either your land or the surrounding land has to be wild lands, wetlands, riparian corridors. Um, at our farm, we are surrounded, our little 22 acres is completely surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of hectares of uh, beautiful wild um, California uh, forests that are made up of oaks and madrones and redwoods uh, and all sorts of wonderful insects and plants and animals. Some of them flummox us from time to time because we have a lot of deer and bobcat and coyotes and, and uh, things that go bump in the night and eat our vegetables, but we still try to coexist with them as well as we can. Crops have to be rotated. We cannot uh, have the same thing grown in the same place uh, season after season after season. We, ha we cannot have a monoculture being an, a Demeter certified farm. Um, what's wonderful about our farm is at the height of the summer season right now, uh, we will have 300 different cultivars of fruit, herbs, vegetables, and edible flowers that we send over to the restaurant um, almost on a daily basis. The astrological planting calendar is observed, so what Steiner theorized is that plants receive energy, of course, not only from the sun, we can all uh, get our minds around that, but also from, from the moon as well, and the uh, other stars up there, including the stars that are important in the astrological calendar. So let me walk you through this. What he meant is that um, he categorized all plants into four different categories leaf, root, fruit, and flower. And those four categories of plants were affected by the stars as they moved around the solar system. Um, and so a leaf plant is affected by water signs like Pisces. And a root plant uh, is affected by earth signs, uh, such as Taurus. I'm a Taurus myself, so I'm, um, it, I, I don't think it's any uh, wonder that my favorite vegetable is a beet, a uh, great root. Um, so, the astrological planning calendar is different for every, um, every continent and it's different for every hemisphere. So there are some folks that get together in Europe every year and they decide what, based on the position of the moon and the stars, what is going to be a great day to plant a root crop, what's going to be a great day to plant a leaf crop. And uh, every year you buy the new calendar and you look. So today is September 7th, right? So you would look on the calendar for um, Europe and you'd find out what, if today would be a good day to plant leaves, a leaf crop, or a good day to plant a root crop 
or even if you wanted to harvest those crops as well. If you wanted to harvest them for long-term storage, let's say you're a beet farmer, one of the things you grow is beets, you would look on the calendar and say, okay, well, today is not a great root day, but tomorrow is a great root day. I will harvest my roots tomorrow, my beets tomorrow. Um, and studies have shown, biodynamic studies have shown that if I harvest those beets on a root day, I'm going to be able to store them longer. So, um, yeah, I saw a couple of people smirking out there about biodynamics, and it's, uh, it's a little bit, can be a little bit crazy, especially at first blush. But the bottom line, to me, is that biodynamic agriculture seeks to improve soil health. It seeks to lower the farm's reliance on outside Im inputs, reducing its carbon footprint. It serves to work with nature rather than against it. It treats animals, the plants, the earth, and each other in a really um, gentle and wonderful fashion. And so, what's so crazy about that? Questions? All right, questions. There's one. Hang on, coming. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering how um, biodynamic farming goes with vegan vegans. Like, if you yeah, don't it's eat not compatible products, no. with veganism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next. That's a good question because we, um, when I was going through my training. Um, with a wonderful Austrian farmer and somebody had asked him the same question and he just, that was his very brief answer. No, it doesn't, doesn't work with veganism. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't work with the vegetarianism. You can decide not to choose to eat the meat. I mean, we could eat our chicken eggs and we can drink our um, goat's milk all day long, but we still are required to treat our animals well, give them plenty of good food, shelter, lots of places to run around and roam around and um, always treat them in a humane way. Hi, I Hi. know one Indian grower that is uh, biodynamic and does the whole routine. Is it possible to do that, to, to, to achieve the same that you say that is not crazy about that, to, to care for the, for the land without going through the extreme of the 501, 502, 503 formulas? Oh yeah, you can, you can still, you can practice as many of the biodynamic tenets as you want, um, but you wouldn't be Demeter certified. And, and for many years, I was a biodynamic farmer without being Demeter certified. And I, I really applaud what Felipe was saying this morning about how some farmers are still being organic farmers, but they're not necessarily certified because it is a bother, it is expensive, and as long as you're doing what you think is right as far as treating the plants and the earth and the animals humanely, then um, you're still doing a lot of good, um, good for your own farm and for your environment around you. So you don't have to do the homeopathic preparations, uh, but you wouldn't be considered a, um, a true biodynamic farm without them. Hi. Hi. Uh, I live in Copenhagen in uh, Denmark, in the middle of the city, and I'm part of a group that uh, we buy uh, organic and uh, also uh, biodynamic uh, vegetables from farmers, and um, people come to collect them every week um, on a um, routine basis. And I was just um, kind of surprised about the thing with the cow horn and uh, stuff in it. I've never heard of that, um, but uh, it's quite interesting. Is it, um, how is it uh, actually proven? Is it a belief or is it like well, scientific proof, the um, improvement of the earth? Yeah. I'll tell you what Steiner believed about the cow. Um, the cow he thought was a sacred animal and he's not the only guy. I think there's a religion out there of, of several billion people that also hold the cow in sacred honor. And so what he, his theory about the cow and the cow dung and how it helps is that the cow is, is, has, back in those days, the cow has horns. The, this is where it gets a little bit weird, as if it wasn't weird already. <laughs> the cow has horns. She is accepting, through her horns, energy from the stars and the planets, and, the, and you're laughing, and the moon and the, and the, and the sun. When I talk about how accepting forces from the cosmos, 
Everybody can agree that life on this planet wouldn't be the way it is, wouldn't be any life on this planet without the sun. The sun is one of those stars up in the sky. And then when you also can accept the fact that the moon has an influence on the tides, this gigantic body of water, and that um, plants are 80, 90 plus percent water. So why doesn't the moon also have an effect on plants, their plant growth? And then uh, there are some, lots of people who believe that the moon also has an effect on us as humans, uh, that we can change our, our behavior according to whether it's a full moon, full moon or not. Um, so if you start to accept that, then it's not that much of a leap to start to think that I also, the, 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 the plants um, and the earth and the terroir and the dirt and the soil on this earth also might be affected by the stars and the other planets as well. So Steiner theorized that the cow with her horns is accepting this energy from the, ast from the stars. And then with her hooves on the ground, she's accepting this energy from Mother Earth. I mean, there's a reason why we call this Earth Mother Earth, not just um, because it's a, it's a fun thing to say. Uh, and she, he, uh, he also re figured that if the cow is eating grass from Mother Earth, the grass is grown from the mother, and the father's son is, is photosynthesizing that grass, and then the cow is ruminating the, um, the, her cud over and over and again, over again. It's, it's infusing that grass in her cud with even greater life force, the force of the sun, the force of the planet. And then as she excretes it, that is some real powerful shit that comes out. And then that is put into these cow horns, and the cow horns are also part of the cow because they've been attached to the cow for years and years and years, accepting the astral energy. And then that's put into Mother Earth for another six months, absorbing more energy. So I'm not saying that you should believe it. I'm not saying that I even, I even swallow it all. But I will tell you that that's what Steiner believed. And he believed that this resulted in dung that was then stirred in water for an hour and sprayed on the land flicked on the land, land with switches or brushes, um, infused the land with this energy, this additional life energy that came, comes from Mother uh, Earth and Father Sun and all the other forces out there in the cosmos. That's where the crazy cow stuff comes. Okay, sorry. I'm going to head back. Hi, um, I have to ask again a question I was asking the water guys yesterday, but I think um, I couldn't really explain what I meant. Um, water is something really important for us, and I was asking yesterday, like, um, there are people who are saying that if water is treated mechanically, like a pump is getting it out of the earth, it's, it, something happens with the water, and it's not the same anymore, it's kind of dead. And the answer yesterday was there's no dead or living water. It's always the same. Do you have any experience with water from your side you can talk about us? Too? Because the way we are treating water is like we take in the water and put it in our osmosis and then in the boiler and heating it up and we're really like raping the water. Of well, some kind. Steiner also believed that water was an important... I mean, all of, all of the life, you know, um, the, the wind, the sun, the water, the soil, all of those forces of nature were important and to use them wisely and in a, in a thoughtful manner. When we, do, when we do our stirring, it has to be done with all natural um, uh, utensils. It should be put in uh, either an earthenware crock or um, a metal container, not anything that's plastic. And the stirring should be done either with your hand or your arm or with a, um, a natural implement too. The first time we did the stirring, uh, the chef that I grow for, David Kinch, came over and he wanted to help me with the stirring and it has to happen for a whole hour without interruption. And he wanted to stir it with his arm. And I kept asking, you know, chef, do you want me to, you know, take a turn at it? He goes, he looked at me, he goes, Cynthia, I'm a chef, we stir, this is what we do. So he had no problem stirring the water uh, for an hour with, because he believed that he was infusing his own life energy into the water that had the dung put in it um, at, while he was um, biodynamizing it, if you will. I always, get, always mispronounce that word. Hi, Christopher. 
Hi, thank you for a great presentation. Um, I have w one question and I, I wanted to make a comment also. The question is um, uh, on a follow-up to Felipe's presentation. Uh, could you give your opinion on what possible uh, financial benefit biodynamic farming provides um, above, beyond, as opposed to regular organic or regular? The other <clears throat> comment, I find this tremendously interesting. Uh, in Stockholm, there's a very large uh, Steiner farm south of Stockholm and Jana. And the interesting thing with, with biodynamics is if we look at quantum physics, uh, none of this is at all very strange. That you put manure into a horn makes it sound strange. But this is really very basic quantum physics. And it would be interesting to see how biodynamics could be studied from a quantum physics perspective. I know that they do a lot of studies with uh, the science behind it, and um, uh, that's interesting. I haven't seen anything with, done with quantum physics. I don't even know if I would recognize it if I saw it, because I don't know much about quantum physics. But uh, as far as the financial aspect of it, it didn't help my farm at all to go with, to be certified. Um, and that, again, that's why I applaud Felipe's um, very bold statement that it's not a big financial um, achievement for farms to get certified unless you are in a market that requires that, of course. Like if you're in a, at a farmer's market and they require you to be certified. Um, I've never been in a farmer's market as far as me selling my wares there. My customers, all my customers come to my farm so they can eat and they can go into any building at any time on my farm and you're all invited and see for themselves how things are grown. So I've never felt a need to, to have that stamp of approval. Um, curiously, what happened is that Demeter called me and they said, you know, we know you're growing biodynamically and there's a lot of articles written about Love Apple. We invite you to go the extra mile and get the certification um, and we're happy to, to come out and, you know, work in your, with your schedule. And I said, I said, well, I don't really need it, but come on out and I'll work with you anyway. And you know, now that I have it, it's kind of cool to say that I am Demeter certified. So it, it's basically more um, brag and rights than anything else. And, do, and, it, I, and I, it, there is a standard there that I always have to meet. Yeah. I was just going to ask, does, it, does that, because it's a global organization, does that make it feel like you're a part of a larger uh, entity? And do, do you have interactions across uh, borders? Absolutely, there's an international conference that happens every year uh, with uh, biodynamic folks. There's a national, U.S. national conference. Um, and that doesn't happen with orga normal organic growing. Just like, like in Brazil, there's 10 certifiers. In California, there's 10 certifiers. Well, how can the consumer really be confident that the, the, uh, the principles of those organic um, uh, Tenants are being upheld uh, in a way that the consumer can feel confident going into a farmer's market or into a grocery store and seeing that stamp and saying, well, what does this mean to be certified? Um, maybe somebody can just decide, I want to be a certifying body for organic farms and set up a website and go pay your $500 fee and I will certify you. Fill out this form and I'll certify you. There's nobody saying that you can't do that. Now I've given you guys all business ideas. Tim, did you have a question? Uh, thanks for the presentation, that was great. Um, uh, obviously you grow a lot of different things uh, and in coffee uh, most of the farmers grow one thing. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have an experience if, if there is a difference in yields in biodynamics versus organics and have you experienced lower yields uh, t towards well, I, conventional? I, never, um, I don't know if there's a difference in yield between organic and biodynamic. It is certainly the case that that those two types of growing will yield less than conventional farming. And that's not only because of the pesticides and the herbicides that are used in conventional farming, but it's also the fact that um, a lot of the uh, crops are either hybrid crops or GMO crops that are bred specifically to be higher yielding or disease resistant or pest resistant or um, herbicide roundup resistant in the case of GMOs. So um, just because something gives you a lower yield doesn't make it less valuable. And in my opinion, a lot of people that grow, that want to eat organically, um, 
that it's, it's beyond the question of whether or not there's a high yield or a high earning power or financial. It's, it's more than that. It's, it's our children. It's, it's um, not putting a, a, dairy, a veal calf in a cage where she can't turn around. Um, and uh, you know, there's just all sorts of things wrong with conventional farming, in my opinion. Hi. Um, I've kind of got a two-part question. Um, I visited a few uh, organic farms recently. And I noticed that there can be a tendency for them to be um, less affected by disease that, that's happening. Um, do you find that, uh, is, that happens with biodynamic farming? And the second part of the question is, I, th I believe with organic farming, in cer certain circumstances, if disease is going to cause a serious problem to the farm, a farmer would be allowed to apply pesticides without losing their organic certification. Is there anything within biodynamic that allows that to happen to, to protect well, you as a farmer? Let's make a kind of a distinction first. There are organically approved pesticides and there are biodynamically approved pesticides. We're talking synthetic um, pesticides when we're talking about the difference between conventional farming and biodynamic or organic. Uh, and as far as disease is concerned, that's one of the reasons why Steiner, back in um, the, the early 1900s, was approached because after the First World War, they saw some, the farmers in Europe saw some marked decrease in the fertility and an increase in the pests and the diseases that were happening in the fields in Europe. So knowing that um, Steiner was quite the, um, uh, the uh, considered quite the intelligent man, they went to him to see if he could figure it out and, and he studied it for a number of years before he gave a series of agriculture lectures to the farmers and he never even used the word biodynamic, somebody else came up with that. And it was all about returning to a system where you created your own fertility and you were not reliant on the effluent of the, of the, of the war machine, which is what, what, what happened after World War I, and you were more reliant on yourself and uh, being more thoughtful about what you were doing. So um, as people started to get back to organic and biodynamic growing, that's when we saw a de decrease then in the rampant pests and diseases that were happening to conventional farmers. Conventional farmer, he sees a pest, he just gets a, cro uh, a crop plane out, sprays the, the crop out of the field and kills all life. And I can, I can tell if, a, if it's a conventional farm just by driving by. I don't even have to stop and look. I don't have to have a sign that tells me it's a conventional farm because there's no life in it. There's no butterflies flying around. There's no birds in there. And there's not one weed. It's just row after row of pristine, seemingly beautiful crops. Um, when you go to a biodynamic and organic farm, it's crazy. It's, it's, it looks like it's, there's, there's weeds and there's... there's um, all sorts of stuff laying around because what's happening is, is all this biodiversity is happening. There's, there's little uh, mice running around, there's butterflies flying around, there's um, all sorts of bugs buzzing around and birds. That's the life that uh, in, a, in a proper ecosystem, the good bugs take care of the bad bugs. The um, good fungi uh, take care of the bad fungi, like mycorrhizal fungi. So those are all things that get killed when there is a mass, you know, totalitarian spraying of whatever to kill one pest. Well, you kill everything. And you kill the bees as well. So the bees, we wouldn't have life on this planet without bees. And we're killing the bees as we're killing the rest of the pests that are flummoxing us. We have one time for one last question. Anybody have a last question? Um, I was wondering, early in your slides, you may have said this earlier, I apologize, I missed the first few. You said that you have to have a protected amount of land around your farm. Or on your farm. Or on your farm. Or on your farm. So. The only way of achieving that, does that mean you just have to buy a lot more property? Because how, well, you, you, how can you... No, you, know, you leave some of it alone. Okay. Or you, in the case of some organic, um, some organic certified farms, you have to plant what are called hedgerows. And okay. these are um, rows upon rows of perennial hedges that are going to be your habitat for your good bugs and your good birds that are going to do battle with the bad stuff. So um, on an organic farm, if you don't have it already in the wild state, you have to create it. 
-hmm. And with biodynamics, it could be the same thing as well. Yeah. Uh, you either create it, these, um, these biodiverse areas on your land, or it's naturally occurring and you leave it alone. In my case, I've got 22 acres and about 15 of those acres I haven't touched yet. Yeah, and I probably never will because it's on a very steep slope. And then all the land around us is all um, forests as well. Okay, folks. Thank you <laughs> Thank so you. much.